two of Revelation and walk through the last book of the Bible. Remember last week we said that uh, Revelation means uh, apocalypse, and apocalypse actually means uncovering. It doesn't mean end of the world, it means uncovering. That is that Jesus is giving us uh, un unlocking or uncovering a mystery for us. The idea is that there's going to be a lot of, 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 of messy things going on in the world, that's what we'll call it. And um, those in the know can look at some of those things, understand what's going on, and find comfort and hope. Now, um, I'm going to kind of walk through the book of Revelation. I'm having this, like, you ever have a conversation and, and you, you realize you're oh my gosh, you're having, like, you see this out of, out of body, you're kind of looking down at yourself, you can't believe that you're, oh my gosh, I'm really having this conversation. Well, that's the way I am with, like, oh my gosh, I'm really launching into a study on the book of Revelation, because there's, there's so much um, to unpack, so many possibilities of, of what it thinks could mean, and, and it's just kind of one of those things where I'm like, I can't believe that I'm, like, really doing Revelation. Now, I won't go past Thanksgiving in our weekly walk through Revelation, even though by the end of the day I'm only going to be through, I think, verse 7 of the whole book. But I won't go past Thanksgiving, and if everybody's lost or I get bored, we'll quit before that. Okay? So I'm just going to kind of walk through the major themes of the book of Revelation. Would love for you guys to all, uh, throughout the week, read a few chapters to kind of stay with where you're at. I hope that some of you have read chapter 1, maybe this past week. The more you do that, the more I think you'll connect. And it's also the kind of series that you may every few weeks go back on YouTube and listen to some weeks prior, especially week one. If you missed last week, um, just some introductory material, circle back around. Today, uh, the, the title is Coming with the Clouds. So we're going to talk about what that phrase, coming with the clouds, would have meant 2,000 years ago or uh, more what it could have meant. Okay, so what are the possibilities of, of that? So what I would like for you to do right now is to kind of get you ready for the material today is think through um, uh, uncertainty, uh, times of uncertainty. Can you imagine there being times of uncertainty in life like this so um, beautiful and, and succinct these days and, and easy? Um, obviously, uh, we have some shared difficulties as human beings right now. Um, no need to even begin to list the, the shared uncertainties, but then you also have more um, individual uncertainties. We worry about our health, the health of our family, what kind of world we're bringing our children up in, where should our children go to school, what should we do with our kids, what decisions are our own kids going to make? We worry about aging parents, we worry about marriages, we worry about finances, our job, our careers, all kinds of stuff that we have in terms of uncertainty. Well, in the ancient world, uh, the Christians that Revelation was hand-delivered to, um, they had a lot of uncertainties. Because there was this the Emperor Nero, a Roman emperor, um, he was basically a madman who introduced a lot of chaos into the world and made life very difficult for people following Jesus. So at the time that these ancient Christians received uh, this letter, or the visions of Revelation as written by John, um, if you were, if you were, if you had to bet, is the church or Judaism going to make it to the third century? You would have bet no. Because Nero introduced an age of persecution that was out to, like, squash Judaism, like, like, you know, extinguish the Jewish people, and Christians. So that was the kind of uncertainty. So maybe if you could picture, like, uh, in Afghanistan right now, Christians meeting together Sunday morning. Like, that was the kind of uncertainty, maybe even more so, that the recipients of the book of Revelation originally uh, were up against. Okay, so that's a kind of just extreme chaos, uncertainty, persecution, calamity 
that's the backdrop for um, the book of Revelation. Uh, so let's go through a, a ridiculously quick overview. Again, like five sentences that cover this is this is how Revelation unfolds, okay? And again, it's meant to paint symbolic imagery that would give a sense of hope to anyone that can figure out the symbolism. So here's the ridiculous quick overview. Um, Revelation opens with the vision of Jesus and his interaction with seven ancient churches. Next, we get a peek into the throne room of heaven. Then the action starts with the scroll being opened, and as it's opened, there are the famous four horsemen of Revelation. From there, Revelation descends into a series of visions of beast prostitutes, Armageddon, dragons, mountains, earthquakes, angels, 666. Finally, we see imagery of a transition into an age of peace, where God is again with his people. Okay, so that's the book of Revelation. Now, now today and next week, we're going to talk about Jesus interacting with these seven churches. I'm going to introduce uh, the, the, the seven church concept today, and then we'll, we'll spend most of our time talking through what he actually says next week to the seven churches when we talk about doomsday prepping. So we're all going to learn together what we need to do to prep for doomsday, or, you know, come with your favorite... MRE um, recipe, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll share MRE recipes and, and um, bunker locations so that we're ready for Doomsday. All right. Um, again, we said that some people believe the visions in Revelation were uh, mainly for the first century readers. Others believe that those visions started back then for people back then and moved forward into things that we might have today and in the future. Others believe that all the stuff that we read about Revelation, Revelation was for future, like the, the end of the world as we know it. And then some people believe, believe that Revelation is all symbolic, just meant to show the um, everyday struggle between good and evil. All right, so having said all that, uh, let's read from Revelation. I'm going to continue from last week, and we are in verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. So this is John writing to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. So, <clears throat> through that, to frame up the next section of the book, John is telling us, Hi, I'm John. Um, this is John, the disciple of Jesus. And uh, John's modesty never gets in the way. He wants us all to know that, that he was uh, Jesus' favorite here he continually through the Gospel of John. And so that he had a special kind of relationship with Jesus. So he's the one writing, and he's writing to these seven churches. Now we're going to see uh, in a few weeks that he's exiled on this island called Patmos for um, being a church leader, so for, for living out his faith in Jesus, he's, he's exiled, and he's there, and he has these revelations um, from Jesus, these visions from Jesus, and he's sending them to seven uh, ancient churches. Now, we're going to talk name by name those churches next week, but generally speaking, as you read this for your homework, um, understand that there's uh, a few different views on the, the chapter 2 and 3 where we read about these seven churches. Some people believe uh, that these were meant to go to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to literal churches. Um, there were churches in those cities. We know that historically. Some people believe that those seven specific churches were supposed to get those letters in the book of Revelation. Other people believe that the fact that it's seven churches, that that's like a Revelation trigger word, and it kind of is. I mean, seven is all throughout Revelation, and means completion. So some people think that this is the complete church, the global church, and um, these seven churches are where Jesus has encouragement and advice and rebukes for them. It's meant for all Christians of all time because that's the seven churches. Now, others believe that those seven churches represent seven eras of the church. So it starts with, with Ephesus, 
that Ephesus was the ancient church and then through seven eras. Now, um, that view is interesting. Like, that preaches well and so looks. There's absolutely no basis to think that. Um, but it is a view that's out there. And so those are three basic um, views through which people approach the letters to the seven churches. I'll get into that more um, next week. Notice in what we read, the first section of what we read, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who are for his throne and from Jesus Christ. Now there's this Trinitarian formula that we're going to see a few times in Revelation. This is very significant theologically. If you're brand new to Christianity, um, this is one of the few places in Scripture that shows us uh, the, the distinction, yet the oneness, of, of three beings. So there was an ancient Christian controversy. Is there really just like one God and who kind of shows up as Jesus and shows up as the Holy Spirit and shows up as God the Father? Or are there three distinct beings? Well, John is careful to point out he who is and was and is to come and who's on the throne. Then there's seven spirits, which can also be translated sevenfold spirit, which can also be translated the perfect spirit. So most scholars um, believe that this is almost certainly a reference to the Holy Spirit, especially then when you throw in Jesus Christ. There you have the, the three in one, the, the Trinity, the Father on the throne, Jesus Christ the Son, and the sevenfold spirit or the perfect spirit or the Holy Spirit. So you get this Trinitarian formula uh, kind of reinforcing the essence of God. Theologians call it the Godhead, three in one. And it was, it was something that the ancient Christians thought and wrote a lot about, uh, the Trinity. So just a quick reference there that I wanted you to see. Um, now, <clears throat> what we see next, this like, this can't be understated. Okay, this is, this is a big deal, what was going on in the spiritual realm at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. If you're going to read Revelation, you need to be aware of this, and this can frame up uh, how we interpret the entire book. Okay? So, um, John says this. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Let me stop right there for a minute. If you want to, like I had the lights turned up, if you want to bring your Bibles and follow along, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love for you to use uh, one of the ones in front of you. You can keep that. It's a very readable translation. Feel free to keep one. Write notes in the margins, whatever. Bring your own. Write notes in it. Mark it up throughout this series. Or, I mean, you can cheat. I think that's up there, right? Um, but I just want to feel free to follow along. So this is Revelation um, um, 5. 1 to 5, I'm sorry. 1 to verse 5. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, <clears throat> made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. There is a new kingdom being established, a kingdom of priests. Not that one. That's for later. I might have, I must have not. Sorry, I might have left the slide out. So I'm going to read it again. If you want to follow along, go to Revelation uh, 1. And uh, that's the last book of the Bible. Start with verse 5. Sorry about that. Exclusion. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest who is God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Kingdom of priests, glory and dominion forever and ever. Kingdom of priests, I'm saying it a few times so it sticks in your head. New kingdom, gonna last forever. Happening right around this time. New kingdom, Priest in the last part. So here we go. <clears throat> the single biggest difference between Christianity 
in every other major world religion. Because it's been often said that all major world religions are essentially the same. And I get where people come from with that, and there's, it's a little bit true, and that people are reaching out to God, people are trying to love each other, and, and there's definite central themes. But the biggest difference between Christianity and every other major world religion is that other pathways to God focus on you doing things to get right with God and stay right with God. What the scriptures say is that Jesus, through his blood on the cross, just like we read, was a death payment on our behalf. He came to pay the price for our sins, eliminating everything that was between us and God, so we are not a priest. Because up till then, in the Old Testament, there were always priests who would go to God on behalf of a group of people. It was made known that the common people were sinful and separate, but the priests could offer sacrifices to make you right with God. The priests could go to God on their behalf. But Jesus, his death payment on the cross became your death payment on the cross through faith. He's the one who came to earth for you. This is what separates Christianity from other faiths. We are not as followers of Jesus trying to earn rightness with God, trying to maintain rightness with God. We're putting our trust that Jesus did that for us. And so we are now priests in God's kingdom. This was, and this is what cannot be understated, this was a massive shift. Globally, in terms of approach to God, there was a new kind of kingdom. Spiritually speaking, a new kingdom established when Jesus died on the cross and was and, and, and raised again. And as the church began to spread, there was a new kingdom, a kingdom of priests. And, and on a spiritual level, this was earth-shaking. And that's when we look at the book of Revelation. Uh, we, we see dragons, and we say, oh, that's symbolic. And they have, you know, ten horns, whatever, and we see beasts, and we... But sometimes when we hear, like, and the moon would turn to blood, and the, you know, the sun would go dark, we tend to think of that as literal. But the truth is, what happened spiritually, when Jesus raised and the church was born and began to spread, to, to spread what happened spiritually was cataclysmic on the spiritual level of the mountains being torn down, the sun going dark, the stars falling from the sky. Like that could be all symbolic language to say there is something going down in the spiritual world that will change everything. It will change the spiritual world as we know it, and nothing has ever been done like it. So if you're going to say that Revelation is a look at what's going on spiritually in symbolic language, what happened, I'm going to read it again, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The concepts in there, if you've grown up in church, especially the Catholic church, you've heard that kind of language over and over and over, and it's been with us for 2,000 years. This thinking was brand new. There was never anything like it when it came to approaching God, when Revelation came to early Christians. And it's impossible to read Revelation without that in your mindset, that there was something cataclysmic, of cataclysmic proportions happening when the book of Revelation was written as the church was persecuted, Judaism was, was being crushed, but all of that kind of created an environment which sent the church, sent Christians scattering throughout the world to take with them the gospel, the news of this new kingdom of priests. Now, um, let me read to you the next section, verse 7.
And this is where it gets interesting. So, what I want is, if you're here and you know nothing about the Bible, you're my favorite audience, and I mean that, take with you the single biggest difference between Christianity and every other major world religion is that Jesus came for you to make you right with God, and it's not about you learning things. And then if you pick up anything from the rest of this, great. But you're all about that. Like, you found the marble in the oatmeal, you're about to drink from the fire hose, okay? This is, <laughs> this is, this is thick stuff for all my UHF fans out there. <laughs> all right. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So he talks about establishing a new kingdom and eternal dominion forever and ever. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Sounds serious, right? Well, this one verse will show us a lot about how Revelation works. Because what you're going to see is multiple possible meanings, and it borrows language from a lot of different places in the Bible, stuff written centuries before it. And, and when you think about how Revelation, Revelation was originally uh, taken in by a Jewish Christian first listenership or reader, they're bringing all that stuff from the ancient scriptures into it with them. So, so while we typically wouldn't make those connections, to understand context right, we need to know what the first readers would have known as they're hearing things too. I'm going to walk through that. But when you think in terms of coming with the clouds, and possibly, what does it mean? That he'll come with the clouds, and everyone will see him, and they'll be wailing, and, and, and so most modern-day Christians with a little bit of Bible familiarity, especially if you have a Baptist or Pentecostal background, that verse means one thing and only one thing. And it's referring to Acts 1. In Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 9, Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they speak for a moment about the end of times or the restoration of Israel. It says, and when he has said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into the heaven as he went, behold, two men stood with them in white robes. And said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? The same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the concept is, Jesus is with his disciples, resurrection has occurred, he's hanging out for a month or so, and all of a sudden, he is lifted, Neo, end of matrix, just shoots up into heaven, into the clouds. And they are told, someday, this Jesus will return in the same way you've seen him go. So, naturally, naturally when you hear back to Revelation, coming with the clouds, and everyone will see him, and those who pierce him will wail. Like, that's that language, right? That's obviously what this is referring to, <laughs> the second coming. Judgment is coming on those who rejected Jesus and his kingdom. Okay? Now, in that, do you, did I, was I smart enough to put Revelation 1-7 up there? By itself, or did I forget that too? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> There's another way to interpret that. Remember that um, we said we're not anti Semitic here. Any 
punitive language is that group of people at that time and the way they treated Jesus. You could also translate this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the land will wail on account of him. Um, and if you say tribes of the land, it's almost certainly a reference to the Israelites, who also, along with the Romans, pierced Jesus. So this could be in reference to judgment of um, the judgment of God falling on those who pierced Jesus. That's another way to look at that. Now, let's look at borrowed language and I'll wrap it all together and I say I got five minutes left. So um, here we go. Speed round. Um, can you move up to the parallels now? <clears throat> all right. Revelation 1. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and gave us a kingdom of priests who is God and Father. So there's the word kingdom, glory, dominion forever and ever, coming with the clouds, every eye of the even those who pierced him. That's Revelation 1 written around 95 AD. Isaiah 19, written in 700, riding on a swift cloud. So you see coming with the clouds, riding on a swift cloud. There it's talking about God judging Egypt. So what I want you to see here is riding on the clouds. This was a way that ancient people talked about God bringing judgment. It's not necessarily referring to the second coming of Jesus. It may have been John just saying God is bringing judgment. Because there are other places in the Bible where we read about God riding on the cloud to implement judgment on people groups. Keep that in mind. Next. <coughs> Zechariah 12, written in 600 BC. Back in Revelation 1. Those who pierced him will wail. 600 years beforehand. 700 years beforehand. And I will pour out the house of David, that's the Israelites, and have this Jerusalem, that's the house of, of that's, that's the Israelites, through grace, please for mercy, so that when they look on me, and him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child and weeps bitter. Do you see the way Revelation 1 7 is clearly referencing Zechariah 12 10? Like there's nothing new there. And what I want to show you is that throughout Revelation, you can see there's not a lot new in Revelation. It's mysterious is a lot of this repeat stuff. Okay, next one. Daniel 7, this was huge. To him who loves us, and then there's the kingdom, <clears throat> glory forever and ever, coming with the clouds, right? Okay? Coming with the clouds and establishing a new forever kingdom. Daniel 7 was something that was every ancient Jew was waiting for Daniel 7 to be fulfilled. It was written 160 BC, before the time of Jesus. Okay? Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Languages should know all nations, all people, all languages, serving dominion, everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that will not be destroyed. Doesn't Daniel 7 sound just like Revelation 1? When you got coming with the clouds, you got all you got coming with the clouds, you got dominion, you got glory, you got kingdom, you got. Like, it's practically just scrambled around the same concept. All right, now, next. Mark 13, this was Jesus around 30 AD. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And they will send out his angels, gather the elect from the four winds, um, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Truly I say to you, this generation is talking to people. He said, truly I say to you, you guys, he's talking to people back then, people he's talking to, will not pass away until all these things take place. Now that's weird. Let's look at the next one. One last one. So we read, um, we read Matthew 16, which is on the right. Mark 13 says, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So something happened in the first century where Jesus felt that Daniel 7 was fulfilled. 
the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds, who would give a new kingdom, who would establish a new kingdom. Now, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I may be wrong, okay? I think that what a lot of Revelation is about, because Jesus seems to look at his crowd and say, you guys are going to be alive for this to happen. The Son of Man coming in the clouds, a new kingdom established forever and ever. I think that Revelation, a lot of what it's about, is through the persecution of the Jewish people by Rome, the darn near eradication of the Jewish people by Rome, and Rome's persecution and scattering of the church, through that cataclysmic stuff, God's transition to a faith-based approach to God, to a kingdom of priests, that was fully established because by the end of that, the church had spread all throughout the known world, which changed the spiritual landscape of everything. So I think when Paul says he's coming, or when John says he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and those who pierced him will mourn, what he's saying is this Daniel 7 thing, which would have been on everybody's mind, like every Jew and ancient Christian with a Jewish background, which was most of them, they would have known Daniel 7. It was one of the great prophecies of that era, waiting for the Son of Man to come with the cloud to establish a new kingdom. I think what Revelation is saying, there are cataclysmic things happening right now, catastrophic things happening right now. This is all part of that coming with the clouds that will establish a new kingdom. And so for us today, two things. First of all, we live in it that we are a part of that new kingdom that was established. Or unlike anyone before the time of Jesus, we're all priests. Through following Jesus, through participating with his death penalty on the cross, we are right with God. There is nothing separating us from God. And when God looked at what he wanted humanity to be, it was people living in friendship with each other and in friendship with God with nothing between and it took the death and resurrection of Jesus and the scattering of all Christians everywhere to take it beyond just a land-centric place where it had been with Jerusalem and to all the corners of the earth. It's a huge, catastrophic, massive thing that happened around 70 AD. And I think what Paul is, or what John is saying in Revelation is, I'm going to give you these spiritual concepts so that you can understand. And what we're going to see is a lot of what happened in the first and second century today. Well, with the book of Revelation, as God established his new kingdom through Jesus. Now, one last passage of scripture here. Some of my Baptist and Pentecostal friends are like, wait a minute, if that means anything but the second coming of Jesus, we want to fight about it. Okay? That doesn't negate it. It's simply saying that may not have been a direct reference. So I want to take a look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those, as, as others uh, do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, here's the thing with Revelation. There's a lot of maybes, and if you're like me, there's, there's, there's some neat stuff. Like when you see how Revelation fits with stuff that was written in the Old Testament, like I'm fascinated by that stuff. I'm fascinated with the possibilities. And some of you are like, so what? So what? Yeah, New Kingdom, first century. Nero, whatever. There will be a day when the sky will split open and Jesus will return. And Paul says, encourage one another with these words. So what I want you to see through this, and this is my opinion, 
is that through this coming in the clouds language, John was able to give his readers something that they could hope for in their day. God is going to redeem what's going on. And he can give us something to hope for in our day. Because the cloud will split open one day, and Jesus will return to bring in a whole other kind of new eternal kingdom. So I think what you see in Revelation is a lot of language that the ancient Christians were going through immense persecution that said, okay, God is in this, and things are going to get better. And we in our day can say, God is still doing his thing. He's still on his throne. He still is and was and is to come. And one day, and it could be today, the sky will split, Jesus will return, and there is a new and redeemed kingdom to be a part of. So, I know that that's a lot to take in and think through. And here's what I want. If you know very little about the Bible, and after a couple weeks, like, it's not going to get worse than today in terms of, like, fire and stuff, I promise. But if it gets like you're like, yeah, I'm just totally lost, let me know. Um, because I don't want to do something that's going to shut out the people that I most love to teach to for two months, okay? So, so let me know if, if you're just like, you know, you just need to tap out. Um, I got you in, like, the Jesus chokehold and you just tap out. <laughs> Give me that, um, give me that feedback. All right, let's pray. Just stand.